really here, but I think that when you were in school, it was a very interesting time, and I know you. It certainly was. You've often talked about yeah. the man under whom you studied and the special feeling you had for him, and what that signified in, in education in those years. And, and uh, I think it'd be nice if you'd share some of hello, that. Angel Pie. Hello, Angel <laughs> Pye. Hello. Well, hello, dear. He does this to my pants. Uh oh, yeah. Hello. Why? Uh, oh heavens. At Michigan, hmm? Yeah. Uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, I went there as a freshman in 1924. And uh, that's where I met Maynard Linden. He was a freshman in my class. Funny, they had a choice. They had two classes for the freshmen that year. It was in the old engineering building there, but they didn't have a new building. And uh, one was doing the traditional Beaux-Arts type things, rendering the orders and all these things. And the other one was was uh, Knut Lundberg Holm, who was a young, cleanest person I ever saw. He smelled of sweet scents, and his hair was always slicked, and he was immaculate. He was Danish, and en very enthusiastic. Uh, he had a class, an experimental class, and that looked very interesting to me. And you had the choice of choosing the one or the other? In that case. You see, uh, well, I was born in South Haven, Michigan, and, and uh, I used to cut out Frank Lloyd Wright from the Ladies' Home Journal, some of his prairie houses. Right. And I was always interested, you see. When I was 11, I was going to be an architect. And, uh, well, I took an ICS course because my high school had absolutely nothing in the way of drafting, just to get a little better acquainted. Mm -hmm. So when I, I got to Michigan, ICS. The International Correspondent Schools, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they still exist. Anyway, uh, this course that Lundberg Home had was uh, really basic design, the thing that you call basic design, dealing with compositions of openings and uh, plane surfaces and then making models using other materials and combining materials, pieces of glass, and you, uh, cast little things in plaster and compose these cubicle things, and uh, sheets and forms. They're all basically uh, Bauhaus-type things, and that was really his training. Had he studied at the Bauhaus or uh, been influenced by I, some of oh, the teachings? Was, oh, very much so. I'm not, I believe he studied there. At least he was. Uh, that was a background that he had. And uh, well, the court, and that's where Maynard, you see, and I were both freshmen. That's how we were. He was very slim. <laughs> and uh, oh, at the same time, Elil Sarnin was a. Uh, visiting critic for the fifth year, for the fourth year, I guess, with them students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was a terrific guy, and I got very well acquainted with him and his family. In fact, I dated Peep Son, uh, Errol's yes. older yes. sister. Yes. Errol was about 15, I think, or so, at the time, doing murals. Mm. And their mother was a fairly lovely person, and she did miniature uh, little portraits and things, paintings. Peeps on worked in metal and did weaving, typical Finnish. Of course, there was Swedish background in the family rather than Finnish, hmm. but they lived in Sweden. Or they lived in, in Finland. Finland. No, yeah. I wasn't aware but of they that. were a Swedish background. But a charming family, very hospitable, and I was very privileged to, to know the family. I suppose I've deviated from your no, question. No, it's good. Completely. It's interesting. It's all interesting. Um, I, I thought, you know, it, it would be valuable to uh, focus on Lundberg home because you've mentioned him before. Well, he, uh, I would say he was terribly important to me. Mm -hmm. We used to go into Detroit on a weekend or something and walk up and down the alleys at night and see the lights from the lighting in the back of these very 19... Uh, 18 and 20 and 25 buildings with cornices and columns and pilasters in the backs. They didn't have any of those, of course, in the alleys. They were plain. Mm -hmm. The openings were plain. They made no attempt to decorate. Mm -hmm. And as you walk down the alleys and you see some of these convicts coming out with lights hanging, you have beautiful designs and compositions. And you had a lovely time. Walking down the alley. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had to avoid something. Yeah. But that, those are field trips, you might mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, it's especially interesting to me that you studied with him because he represented a breakaway from that neoclassical, neo yeah. bizarre yeah, training schools. that was so yeah. pervasive across the country. I know. 
the way it was when I got out here to USC. You see, I worked in Florida for a year, and then I worked in Pasadena for a year, and then I went back to school, you see, and, uh, and got married. And in Florida, my God, my first job. I went to Chicago in the fall of, or the summer of 25, and it was during a depressed period. I went to 57 different offices trying to find a job. Hmm. I went to Elmsley, and as it turns out, after I had accepted a job in Florida, he wrote and contacted Alma, who he were close then, and said he found a place for me. I wonder what would have happened if, you'd gone back to if, I'd, if I'd done that. What year was that? When you 25. 1925. I went, well, I, I went to Graham Anderson Probst in White, and they had a man called Claire Hosmer in Sarasota, Florida, who had opened an office there, and he'd been in their office. And he, uh, Florida was booming. Florida was mad before the depression. depression in Florida. Florida was booming, whereas Chicago was in depression, you see. And uh, he sent word that he needed a designer, and uh, I accepted. I'd never worked in an office before in my life. But I had confidence, if not brains or experience. And uh, so I went down there, and I learned how to draw palmettos and Georgia pine trees, which were everywhere, and palm trees, all these things and the theater sets that was being done in the way of buildings, you wouldn't believe. They built things out of hollow tile, and they built in some of this coquina rock, natural rock, in corners, and then they plastered the tile and left the rock showing to, to suggest that it might be a stone building. They imported tile from Cuba, which was old, beautiful, uh, neutral colors, and put it on these horrible buildings. Oh, uh, this was so eclectic, you wouldn't believe it, and badly done. But it was an experience. I hated Florida, though, because everything eats everything else. Red bugs eat you if you sit on the beach. Barracudas are the kind that eat people not you eat in the water. And stingrays and Portuguese men of war used to go riding on the beach, and the sand was beautiful. It was like, when it was moist, it was like paving. You could drive on it. But we used to ride Sunday mornings down there, so does, but I go on at length and forget it. In a car? No, we would ride, horses. Oh, horses? Yeah. Uh -oh. Okay, that's right. So, yeah. anyway, I've... How did you come I've, to Los Angeles? Well, my, uh, I always, I liked to garden, always. And my mother-in-law had uh, come out here before she was married and taught school in uh, San Bernardino or someplace. She's tiny, and there were a bunch of Mormons, they were extremely tall, but she took care of it. Anyway, she was raving about California always. And I, being born in Michigan, where it's cold in the winter, I liked to garden all year round. I wanted to, and so that was my dream. And I also liked mountains and difference of level. That's why one reason I didn't like Florida, it was so flat. And uh, so I was determined to come to California early to live. Forgetting, of course, the weeds do just as well as the flowers here, and that was something I hadn't planned on. Which now, right now, I'm behind the eight ball. Awful. Well, anyway, I came to California as a result. A I worked for Joe Casera in Pasadena. It was uh, the next job, really. Charming guy. Then he eventually went into movies, but he had very good taste. The things he did were done well. They weren't done badly. And he had a good sense of composition and design and restraint. So even though they were, well, they were really, uh, oh, Dalmatian in character rather than Italian or Spanish. <laughs> and it, uh, the, the things in Dalmatia are rather handsome and interesting. They have just a, not Gothic, but they have a suggestion of some detailing that is, takes it away from the others. And that appealed to him. Of course, he had books on the subject. And this door came out of, for this house, came out of that page, and this came out of that. I mean, that's the way they did it. Mm -hmm. But he did it well. Now, what, what year was that when you came Well, here? that was 25, 6, 7. Just 27. So you were two years in Florida? One year in Florida. Uh, let's see. Oh. Well, that was 26 then, it had to be. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, my, the trouble is when you live this long, there's so many things that you could say about personal affairs that have no bearing on anything, and sometimes you get carried away. Anyway, I worked with him in Pasadena. I met Gilmore Brown on the train coming out, and uh, Maurice Wells, his leading man. And <laughs> very interesting, I was in a couple of plays over there, but I have no voice, you see. I mean, it's cottony. But I enjoyed the contact, and it made it all very interesting. In Pasadena? Oh, yeah. At the Playhouse? Oh, yeah. So that was a part of your... Well, the amusing thing, the amusing thing is that Robert Young was one of the cooks in uh, Cyril and Berserac, and I was too. <laughs> Only he could speak well, and my voice is not the kind that goes. But he was, uh, he was going to be an actor, and I wasn't, you see. Anyway, uh, that's all. But again, I, I, too many beside the points. No, no, it's interesting. It's all interesting. Well, nothing is that interesting. Well, after that, uh, I started, uh, oh no, before I started USC, you see, I went up uh, to Oakland and met Alma and David, her son by my brother, who was seven at the time, and he called it his wedding, which is fine. And uh, I had found, uh, we went house looking. I had a 21 Studebaker, which you had to have the right speed to be able to get it out of any gear or into. <laughs> I found a house up on Tam 49 Tamil Pass Road, and this was interesting only in respect to the fact it was extremely modern. It was built in 1912 by Shirley Turner, who was, had never married, but she'd studied in Paris for years, and uh, had young students she was teaching drawing. She had bark tint paper and pastels, and uh, then she'd had a stroke. The house is built in sort of a canyon up on the side, and there were two sort of units over a, a two-car garage below. Her sister, who was a shadow of her, and she, what a character, lived there. But she'd had a stroke and had to be moved out of the uh, house above. And it turned out to be almost seven levels up there, uh, you know, up the hill. And, was this uh, Berkeley? Or? Berkeley, mm -hmm. right up. Uh, Euclid, and then up on Tamil Pass Road. Oh, uh -huh. And we lived there for $25 a month. Alma remarked that she said it's like uh, living with a beautiful woman, but after three months, you weren't so sure. The laundry was in the ground, in the basement, and the little garage thing was never used, and then up a flight of steps in the shape of a question mark, but she was quite a gal and a studio 12 feet wide, and it had a slightly curving thing. It was done in uh, gray stained redwood board and batten. One section of the wall, exposed structure inside, one section of the wall opened out, and here were the, the oak trees that you looked through. Mm -hmm. Around it was a seat that you lift the top, and in it were the children's drawings. Mm -hmm. It sounded like uh, she must have connected with the Maybeck crowd of the Working with the this was, with the hillside and yeah, using natural but, materials. but uh, it doesn't at least, resemble at least, No, but subscribing to those and ideas. And she believed in natural finishes. Paint mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. She used dry, pure pigment and uh, kerosene. Mm -hmm. It made the building highly inflammable, but nevertheless, uh -oh. it it was clear, and the pigment uh, dissolved in it. And she used pure, pure ultramarine blue and, and vermilion in certain areas. And the body of the house was a neutral, mossy, gray cast, and it was handsome, <laughs> absolutely handsome. So, what what were you doing in Berkeley? Well, I was I started at UC. Ah. And uh, I in, in architecture. Oh yeah, of course. I was continuing my education in Berkeley, uh, assumedly uh, being uh, I had thought I'd been in the state long enough, but I had have a much less tuition because mm -hmm. we were broke. And I'd been in here not, I liked a month, and so I had to pay the full tuition. And in any case, I stayed there one semester and I couldn't stand the wraparound patis of the military drill that kept coming down in the fall, going up the hill. I didn't like it anyway. And uh, I didn't think too much of the school then at the time. And so I... Was that John Galen Howard? Yeah. yeah. He was the head of I the I think he was. Uh, I had a terrible professor in calculus up there, and uh, I just barely passed it. But part of it was due, I think, 
to the to the confusion. Mm -hmm. So you didn't stay. Oh no, I had no intention of it. Well, besides, I wanted to live down here. The climate I liked better. I see. So we came down here and found a nasty little house behind the Shrine Auditorium, but most convenient. And I would go over to the school there, and so I we stayed there for a year, and then another little place, and then we came out here and bought an old house out here for the price of a lot. I wouldn't tell you what it cost. It was 40 years old when we bought it, and that was quite a that was more than 40 uh, years ago. Let's see. That was about 1930. Mm -hmm. I bought it. Mm -hmm. But all these things are so, uh, they're not directed to anyone interested in architecture, they're just, uh, they're just historical in a way. How was the school at USC at that time? That was Whether still... it was Dean, and uh, I tried to encourage him to get Neutra, who was freshly here then, or soon before, to come and address the students. And he, he was adamant, he said, I wouldn't have that man darken the door. Uh, which was amusing. So it was staunchly Beaux-Arts still. Oh, yeah. But uh, the things that people were doing weren't all Beaux-Arts. Because the Beaux-Arts, during that period, was uh, the form was there, but the subject matter was modifying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did some things that I don't think I would ever build today, but at least they weren't traditional. Was Rafael Soriano in school still? That well, I was ahead of him. But you were ahead of him. Oh, Lord, yes. He was, I think, two years behind me. Chris Choate was in my class. Did you know Chris at all? I know his name. Great guy. Fine artist. And uh, oh, so many. Oh, Boris Levin was a year behind me. That's where I met Boris. Our son was just a year old and born there. And Boris was fresh from Moscow, and his English was not. He was very quiet. They thought that he was a sort of a mute. In other words, that he couldn't, because he didn't want to try. But I met him there, and we became very fast friends, and have been ever since, and he's coming to dinner tonight. I mean, we've been together so long. He held my son when he was this big. That was 1929, thereabouts. So you finished at USC? 31. 31. Yeah. And then? Oh, dear. Herb Powell was my critic, and he was a very sweet guy. Uh, uh, he was a critic on one year, not mm -hmm. the fifth year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gave me work a couple of summers, uh, summer work. And uh, uh, he offered me a job when I was through, and I worked with them, and I stayed there much too long. Because he and I, from it became Smith, Powell, and Mortgage? It was Smith, Powell, and Mortgage at the time. Originally was Marsh. And then Smith and Powell came in. Well, Herbert is a, was a very sweet guy, but we didn't agree on design, basic design principles, you see. And so when I was offered a membership in the firm in 1940, I guess, or something, well, 12 years later, I, uh, I didn't accept because I just couldn't. There's no way. I decided my own was the only way I was going, so I did. But you stayed with them for 12 years? I stayed with them for school. 12 years. Well, partly I built the house in 36, you see. And uh, I was I had payments to make, and it was security. And so I uh, also I had moderate control of the design. I didn't have final control. Obviously, well, he was the designing member of the firm, but he was happy to delegate it. But I introduced some things there that he wouldn't have done if I hadn't been there, but that was the only satisfaction. Mm -hmm. D.D. Uh, Smith was one of the greatest people I ever met. He was a structural engineer and very forthright from Kentucky. And he was a square shooter. I should focus on your mm -hmm. direction here. Well, uh, you, so you left the firm. Did you strike out on your own at no. that time? No. Well, no. Then World War I came along. Hmm. And there wasn't any business. And I worked in Northrop in the illustration department for a year. It nearly killed me. I enjoyed the illustration. I learned how to do perspectives. <coughs> You'd have 40 foot drawings, and you make a perspective here, and you were drawing what was on those drawings. And measuring point perspective was such a device to be able to do that. 
that I learned it, and so ever since then I can do perspectives from every direction, upside down and backwards without any effort, and it was really a grand training. The trouble is in the, uh, in, in, in such a place, <coughs> the people, in, uh, I ended up in charge of the swing shift. We were on a mezzanine, and the ventilating fans, no air conditioning, ventilating fans made such a racket you could hardly hear yourself, and down below were the presses for metal and drop hammers over here, absolutely bedded them. I had interesting people, some of them didn't belong there at all, but I mean they were very nice, but so few of them uh, understood the idea of working, getting a job done. It was time. And I'm accustomed to trying to <coughs> set up a thing and do it and get done and on to something else. Mm. But this was not the philosophy. And of course, that's true of, bureau of bureaucracies, usually, right. or, social, or security, where they are a civil service. They don't have the incentive to proceed. And that nearly killed me. How long did you work there? I worked there a year and got pneumonia and nearly died. <coughs> the only time I've ever done it. <coughs> that was Sorry. the year of, <coughs> of blackouts and rain. And the parking lot was this deep in water. And the emotional strain of all this stuff. We were making uh, uh, production illustrations of jigs, things that would uh, you would build things on. So they're really <coughs> a negative of the thing they were assembling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. But we had to do this so they would know how to do it, which was interesting. Well, anyway. Uh, that got me on. Summer Spalding got me out of hock, as it were, because he was working on a Red Cross building where there was a, a necessary construction, and he was a sweet guy, and he signed the papers, and I started for him. So I worked there as an associate for a year, I think, or something like that. And then I worked uh, Adrian Wilson downtown with somebody I had known quite a while. You know Adrian, of course. Well, he's a very dear friend. You've worked in all these important firms, those early Los Angeles yeah. firms. Well, Adrian Wilson was a, uh, he didn't, <clears throat> he had good taste, but he didn't pretend to design, and he liked what I did. And uh, uh, I opened my office in 1944 in a room right adjoining his because he had some things he wanted me to associate with him on as a consultant, really. But I would do the designing. He would get paid, and then I'd get paid, which was fine. I got paid. But uh, I had a little one-room office there right next door in the architects, old architects. Room. That was my first, <laughs> and my first job was an interesting job. I don't know how they happened to come to me, but they did. Uh, her name was Marta Divers, and his name was Ed Moffat. And they'd lived together without marriage. In those days, that was not common, as common. And. Uh, 25 years or more. They were fairly old, you know. But boy, their both names had to be on the plans. She was, her identity was, oh, she, oh, she had studied with, uh, who was this famous early dancer with all the veils? You know. Mm -hmm. Isadore Duncan. Isadore Duncan. Mm -hmm. She had danced with that kind of deal, and she really made you almost, you could almost see this thing with her manners and all the rest. Strange. Also a health enthusiast. I went out to see them at uh, some kind of a party thing before I did much on the house. And uh, she was serving raw this and raw that, and <laughs> orange juice was the drink. She said, do you like the pulp? <laughs> and uh, I, I love the pulp, but the way she asked me, it was too much. But nevertheless, it was an interesting experience. And we used, uh, at that time, they were making some precast concrete units that were two feet by four feet. And they were interlocking with steel rods, uh, no mortar, no grout. Steel rods down in as a mechanical connection. And then there were bond beam things that were sort of holding it together. It was an interesting unit, nap blocks they were called. And I used them on the house. And, uh, but they didn't want to supervise. They wanted to do it themselves. Well, I did. And I didn't see the house. Hmm. I've always been curious. It was built in La Cunata, I think. I've almost been tempted to go by there sometime to see if it's still there. What, what year was that built? Oh, 44. 40. 44 mm -hmm. or 5. Mm -hmm. But this was something that was available in the market. Mm -hmm. It had wood mullions and glass, 
and uh, wood roof construction and the walls were those precast units. And they ran were run horizontally and vertical and horizontal joints continuous. On the interior, they staggered, you see. Same pattern, but staggered half a block, which gave the continuity and the interlocking quality of the wall. It was a, it was a good design. That was your first house? Yes. It, well, that's my first, no, this was, this was really my first oh, house this here. One, this one, your this first. This was in 37. That was in 44. That's client. the first house in my office. Right. That's right. An interesting client, though. Well, from then on, it just, it's been a very mixed process. Little things here and there, odds and ends. I'd worked on schools in Marsmith and Paul. So after I had my own office, soon after, I had that just a, a year, I think, down there. I, I opened my office and I used my study here. I had room for me and one man. And uh, I got an LA school job because I knew these people, you see, through Marsman and Paul. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of many LA school jobs. But of course, many of their jobs were so limited in their, from a design point of view, because they, were, they had standards, and these were compositions of standard rooms. But that's kept the ball rolling. But the houses and the other things, they're so personal and individual, I've enjoyed a great deal. Which are the projects that, that you really feel the strongest about? Well, one of the, the house projects that I really was most excited about is one of the more recent ones, and that was the Lebrun House. Because I got very well, I got to know, see, at the time, Rico died a few months after it was finished. Mm -hmm. That was Rico Lebrun, the artist? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I have two of his paintings upstairs. They were never exhibited. They were in a drawer. I didn't get them at the time, though. I got them later from Constance. But anyway, that was an experience. He was the most articulate artist I've ever met. He had a very uh, complex, troubled uh, thinking in relation to art and painting. His mother or father, one or the other, was an agnostic, and the other was a devout Catholic, and there was a conflict going on in his thinking, which influenced the subject matter of so, a lot of his paintings. But irrespective of the subject matter, he was a great painter. And some of the subject matters were telling. And Constant, of course, was the daughter of Reginald Johnson, the old-time architect, who I knew very well. And uh, so it was a very exciting, stimulating experience, probably the most almost of any I've ever had. Uh, unforgettable. Mm -hmm. That's and I like the house. Mm -hmm. It's exposed concrete, the major walls, uh, with nothing. I mean, I use Colton cement, which is a warmer color than the Riverside, which is bluer. Mm. And it's a much better background for things if you're not going to do anything with it, but leave it. And with his paintings, there is a magnificent background for them. So it, in that respect, it worked very well. Then we used color on interior walls that were not concrete. But the studio was an elegant room, 20 by 40 and 12 foot ceiling, and lined with doors, except for the painting wall, that were 4 by 12, and they were hollow core made by Douglas Aircraft, and they never worked. They were hinged, because he did such large paintings. And he wanted a wood floor, it was wood floor construction, hardwood floor, because he liked the feel of the floor. And after he died, a year or so later, she married John Crown, the pianist. And uh, they, were, they were all very close friends for years before that, but he was such an opposite to Rico, a gay person, in contrast. But he had two grand pianos in the studio, and the residents of the Holocaust doors and the wood floor, he said he'd never played in such a lively room. <laughs> That's marvelous. That which was sort of fun that it worked that it for both. That it served both, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. But then Constance has sold it because it was just apparently just too strong for her with the memories mm -hmm. and things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who is in it now. I have no idea. But that was a house I liked particularly. What were the materials that you mainly worked in? Anything, <laughs> whatever. Well, I used the most economic things for a low budget would be uh, mm -hmm. conventional construction, wood stud and plaster and drywall inside, which I used on many jobs just because this gave them, uh, well, it also is resistant to weather more than things that are laid up with lots of joints. And it doesn't require the maintenance that the wood surfaces do. 
Although some, now your house is, is, is whatever you did to it, the wood is maintaining itself well and looks very handsome. Very little. I know, but some of these places do other things to the wood and then it's dynamite. I know, it's difficult. It's and difficult. It, it's, yeah. But I used, well, I, the Beck house I did up on uh, some years ago, that was an AIA National Award, one of the few of the National uh, I got. Uh, the people that bought that house later, and that was horizontal wide redwood um, ship on, or TNG. Mm -hmm. And exposed beams and planks, roof, and insulation on that, the whole works. It was a wood house, essentially, in structure. It was flat, roofed. And uh, it was an interesting plan because of his requirements and the canyon going up the thing, which later flooded down and went through the house. Had to be, but he had insurance to take care of it. But then he, he was transferred to, uh, he was a, a doctor interested in isotopes, things of the sort. He was transferred back to John Hopkins. Mm -hmm. He sold the house, and whoever bought it, oh, heaven help us. They put shiny varnish all over the redwood and a ready yeah. stain. There was a concrete curb wall around a patio with a wooden fence, and they covered that with mixed Arizona rock, red and white, and, you know, like a disease. I look That's away until yeah. I go by. That's too bad. But it was, a, it was uh, another type. Well, the Edelman house I did in Beverly Hills some years ago in the old Chapman estate. O'Neill Ford uh, from San Antonio had the job, and his uh, Lucy Edelman was a dear friend. and. Uh, she introduced me to him, and we had dinner together, and he said, look, this is too far away from me. Would you take over? And this was in a preliminary stage. So I did, but I kept the character of his design, which I was in full accord with. It was, again, a wood exposed, we used laminated beams because of the bigger spans, and a three-inch plank on the deck and insulation. I did introduce an air floor heating ventilating system, which was expensive, but it worked very well. And it was a concrete slab, part of it, and great. And uh, that's a different character. Going, going back to the early years again, were there any ideas that you were particularly interested in? Any? I asked him if he could do a little remodeling or something in some of their stores, and he turned over to me. And I had a chain of, of what was it, Foster Freeze? Not Foster Freeze, one of those things. Uh -huh. God awful. <laughs> Terrible stuff. Best not to try it. Anyway, that's what I was doing interiors and storefronts on those for a number of years and, and was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Paid some bills. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were better than if they hadn't been designed and been allowed to come from the uh, where we were building it. Were, were you consciously involved with the idea that? that you were breaking away from the old, you know? Oh, well, this, this is, uh, I had this feeling, even when I was a child with Lloyd Wright, I said, well, this junk that everybody else is doing, I think this is, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never been influenced by him except by philosophy. Mm -hmm. And you, and you know, there are a couple of things that you said that makes me feel that you probably had this uh, idea inside. Oh, yeah, be, oh, yeah you're, you're having worked well, with Lundberg Holmes. Well, that, of course, crystallized it very when thoroughly. When you came to USC, you wanted to hear Neutra. So oh, you of identified course. him oh, with a new oh, of idea oh, yeah. in design. Sure. But was it more of a just a natural growing into it for you? You weren't uh, it was, it politicized. Wasn't, it about wasn't, it. oh, no, no. It wasn't a change. I, I never felt any differently. I've never designed a traditional house on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody, uh, and actually, uh, I don't accept that type of commission. If somebody wants just uh, a movie set, I'm not interested, unless it's to be a movie set, and then I could enjoy it, because I've done, uh, I could do that type of thing. But Joe Casera, I did some full sizes of, of uh, Mexican Baroque cabbages and things the size of the wall in charcoal, and had a lot of fun. It was doodling, but it was sort of fun. And he was doing a building that needed some cast stone panels, uh, these sizes. And so I, in his conference room, I, we set up and hung the, the butcher's paper and stretched it around uh, from the tacks. And I went to work and I had a lot of fun. But that was just an exercise in a way. Right. Do you see um, some irony, or I see some irony, in what's happening today? Where you have, have come out of a period in the beginning 
course, you where see, that was the norm. Uh, my problem, well, it wasn't the norm. It was the norm among uh, a few. It wasn't uniform. No, I mean the, I mean the neoclassical kind of. Oh, the neoclassical. Yeah. yeah well, this I never could uh, could uh, feel. Uh, mm -hmm. It was wrong. Mm -hmm. Because today, young people are again are being pointed in that direction. I'm not so sure. From European uh, uh, influences that well, have come here. Well, some have, of the. Uh, if you're reading the press. Well, the press. Uh, are a bunch of enthusiasts generally, and they don't really know much about it. I don't. I don't think that the th some of these uh, glowing articles about some of the stuff that they're publishing uh, is very significant. They're not in a position to to express opinions of any importance. I, of course, as far as I'm concerned, there were certain basic things in design that uh, are true no matter when. I have some chairs that came from a, one left, maybe another one with a broken leg, from a, a little uh, meeting house in Michigan, made of applewood, and they were always painted, they were never anything else, and the back, well, it's sort of a comb-back type, not comb-back, but I mean the uh, basic ones, are, but absolutely a plain back and train things, shaped nicely, and the legs doing the right thing. They're very handsome. And you look at them in like a Van Keppel green chair that's well done, I would say, I, I wouldn't suggest changing it. And these little chairs have a little of that same quality. Now those were done, my God, 200 years ago maybe. <laughs> and so I feel that good basic design is, uh, remains pretty well. If it becomes very complicated and, and self-conscious and, and contrived, it dies. Hopefully. Well, I think, well, actually, I, I think it just goes out of fashion, you might say. No, it's true. How about the Spanish houses? They are building a few right now, which I guess is hard to believe, but largely by contractors, not by architects. But they're doing them just because they're tired of something else. But you could go up and down the street anywhere in the last 40 years around here, and you can name all the different influences. You go down the street, right side by side. I don't think that was true in Europe so much because they didn't have the communication as much. You don't think of cities in Italy as being so, um, well, contrived is the word, I think. Of course, the people in this yeah, country... Yeah, more naturally. Yeah, well, it developed rather than... Mm -hmm. uh, Over a long period of time. Yes. And Which this, is of course, we is... Had. Well, no, and, and don't forget there's a lack of culture in this country, at least a, a sense, a uh, self-conscious feeling of lack of culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because that's back of all these, these um, eclectic movements. Absolutely. I agree with you very much so. It's an insecurity on their part. Yes. They'd be confident and say, well, I'm going to do it the way I think it should be, to hell with all these others. They might come up with something that was indigenous and something that really had something to do. And of course, with our communication today, it makes it a problem to develop a period, uh, I, I mean, an indigenous character in, an, in a, an area. Because thanks to the press, the new architecture press, everyone gets the same magazine all over the country, and they either like or don't like or whatever, but they have seen it, and it leaves an impression. Mm -hmm. So there's, there isn't a, a nice, fresh beginning, because there is no such thing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, as far as construction methods, all over the world, they're building steel frame buildings or concrete frame buildings. So that isn't a local thing anymore. I mean, it's you see one in, in Rome, and you see one in Philadelphia. And except for the title, you aren't sure where it is. Whether that's, uh, I think that's a result, perhaps, of communication. Yes. And I think perhaps we should, if possible, try to narrow it down, certainly in, in smaller projects, to something that has a little more of the sense of the area. More of a regional quality again. Yeah. But I think that can't be done self-consciously. Mm -hmm. It has to come naturally. Mm -hmm. If it's forced, it doesn't survive. What are your thoughts about the future, Gordon? Oh, that's a nice question. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm always optimistic. I think, have you read, ever read The Doomsday Syndrome? It's a book by a British physicist. I have it upstairs. I wish I could remember his name because he's an important writer. 
But he, he, in answer to all these environmentalists, in answer to all these other things that say, oh, we're going to run out of oil in so many years, we have so many gallons left, ridiculous. They don't know. They keep finding some somewhere else. But the important thing is that if we really get in trouble, man is not stupid. Man comes up with some way of solving the problem and does. And this book is in that general direction, in contrast to the Silent Spring and all the rest, which were just sheer uh, emotion, nothing else, without any regard for other elements. But I feel that same way about architecture. I think we've passed through, oh my God, you look at the things that happened over hundreds of years in the past, and the changes in architecture and the developments, they rise and fall to the Renaissance and all these things, all these things, why become emotional? Because that, none of these things are permanent. And sometimes what they end up with is going to be better. So I think that's true today. I think people, architects perhaps, have gotten a little bored with uh, very simple basic buildings. And if they aren't, you can take the same simple elements and with a certain amount of skill, you can make it far more interesting if you have the talent. But of course, talent is limited. And you might get a lot of dull buildings which we have. And out of those, once in a while, there's one that's really elegant. And you can't really see what the difference is. But there is something there that makes it elegant. And people that are bored with that have to start doodling, which they're doing. <laughs> and sometimes they do things for shock value, merely to get attention. It's the old basic urge to be important, you know. That's higher than anything else. People are afraid they're not important. They're afraid they might be no better than a bug or a, or a plant. But I don't think they are. I think we're just part of an overall scheme of things, and who are we to think that we're better or unusually different from anything else? I don't think we have a right. We should be grateful for the differences we have. But don't make believe that we have things we don't. <laughs> Marvelous analysis. Any well, other questions that you'd like to put We forth? sort of fumbled around, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no, I think I think it's been marvelous. Wonderful. Any key then? Well, we were talking about the, the scale of this house. housing towards mass housing or, well, or collective housing or smaller housing. They keep <coughs> proposing this, mm -hmm. and yet every so often we come back to uh, some kind of a survey or something, they find there are more small family houses in Baltimore, an area where they, they were saying they had uh, this direction. Uh, and then you have to go back to people themselves. There are many people that are not interested in surroundings as much as they are in just a place to live. And those going into multiple housing is a natural. And there are probably more of those now than there used to be, I think. With more women working, they don't have the time uh, to maintain a home as they have in the past. Of course, there are many that do. I, I'm not sure it's a majority that does this, but there are many. But I don't think people are going to, people haven't changed for thousands of years, their basic urges. I don't think Changed by our heads. They had as much culture in the, in the Mediterranean coast of Turkey before Greeks mm -hmm. than we have today. There is much, certainly in the cultural things, music and art and literature and all the rest. So I don't think people have improved particularly. I don't think they changed much. They vary. There's about as uh, much proportion of talent and good ones and bad ones. Uh, you can take any group of any size and you can come up with about the same proportions. So I think as far as people are concerned, if they haven't really changed very much, some of the basic urges remain. And nothing to do with language. I mean, any uh, language is one area. But the people in Africa and the people in Europe and the people here, as far as uh, love, sex, eating, drinking, uh, pleasure, and, you know, hates, they all go, they're about the same. You have to know the language. I, I think the thought was that um, the scale of rooms that you were working in this house and in many of your houses yeah. uh, changed over the years in terms of desires of people when they 
well, grand, grander each, houses? Well, and are we not coming <clears throat> to a point where we should again focus on a more uh, I don't think modest you can, approach uh, to room think, size due to uh, cost of building and all of that? Yeah, but the cost of a larger room is just a little more than the cost of a smaller room. If you're plumbing and you're electrical and heating and all the things, uh, if you have the same number of bathrooms, the size of the room, it doesn't change the cost very much. But the overall house would be affected if every room was enlarged, would it not? The cost of the land. And the cost well, of the, the land. Cost of, okay, then you're getting into a place. For, yeah. And this, of course, we're now in, a, in, I would say, a very short temporary phase where land is ridiculous. Of course, the building costs are too. Mm -hmm. My God. That's $80 a good. square foot for a house? <coughs> well, most people can't afford it. That's the problem. Right? And so I've had one or two clients. We were modeling existing houses, and it cost more than a, a good house a few years back. But nevertheless, it's not as much cost as it would be to replace the house. Right. And you can establish a certain change of character enough to, to reduce the complexity if it happens to be. I did, I did a remodeling recently up on top of Beverly Hills for client, clients, and uh, it was done by Paul Laszlo originally. And they had bought it some years ago. I hadn't met them for some years after they bought it. But they'd done some remodeling in the interior, which is amazing when I saw the drawings. They did a very good job. Uh, removed the fault ceiling and moved it flat, and the interior was much better, and they changed it. It was dark cork, and they removed it. You know, it, it was a terrible house, really. But then my job was to, I had to put in some steel beams and open up some a wall with a view from the living area. It was crowding, and the dining room was narrow, and the, the uh, sort of a guest room study thing, had a bathroom in the corner looking toward Los Angeles, which you could have used in the room, as far as the view. So we cleaned that out, and made a very nice, uh, well, like a family room. And uh, the dining, we moved into the, two feet into the kitchen because it was much too wide for one person to work. It was ridiculous. It was too wide for uh, one person and not wide enough for a table in the middle, you know? It's no good. Anyway, we did quite a bit of remodeling, and it was not a, an absurd. And the house is a much better house, just by the arrangement, and simplified the color scheme. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, I, I think people, I don't, uh, well, you asked a question, I deviate naturally. Well, no, not really, because there's, there's so much more remodeling with the high cost of building. Well, of course. Land, it's almost a different type of architecture. Yeah. You should teach parallel courses in a new design and remodels. Yeah, well, the design elements remain the same. Your approach, what you're trying to do, if it's a nasty arrangement, you're trying to clean it up, trying to reduce the complexity, trying to make the spaces seem more spacious and less chaotic, eliminate openings that are cluttered here and there, and emphasize ones that would give space to the house. I mean, it was really designing. Well, of course, I designed a house, a model house for the California industry, or was it? Or out there. Uh, what were they? Construction Industries Exposition, oh, okay. some years ago. And uh, I got an award on it. And it was there for two weeks. Done for free, and the contractor held the title of the house, and he asked too much for it because people seemed to like it. And so I don't know whatever happened. I'd rather not know. But it was a nice house, I liked it. And uh, I don't know, as far as the basic thing, I, uh, back to your other point, I think there will always be a certain percentage of single-family houses because I can't imagine ever living right next to another family. Of course, I like the outdoors, and some don't. My son just bought a, several years ago, bought a kind of condominium in Walnut Creek. He's a standard uh, chemical division. And uh, he just a month or so ago, bought a house in Arinda on the north side. And it's a very nice house. It's a small lot because he doesn't want to spend too much time in the yard, but it has balconies and it's probably 20 years old. But he, apparently it's a very nice house and he's just delighted mm -hmm. to have air and view and trees and things. Of course, that's just being specific. But I do think that people, uh, quite a percentage of people, I think, are much happier, even in a poor little thing on a lot, and they are crowded. And I think I'm probably prejudiced, but it can't be helped. Who isn't? <laughs> Thornton, if you were to um, 
characterize the most important um, aspects of your practice, of your architecture? How would you express that? Most important aspects? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that really... Well, the, um, well I, uh, I don't know. The characteristics that, that you're most proud of or feel most, have found most satisfying? Well, satisfied? I have, in a way, been consistent, perhaps dull in consistency. I don't think so. But nevertheless, there are certain things that I've feel this is the way I want to do it. But of course, I'm not inflexible, really. I try a thousand things, overemphasizing, uh, to accomplish something. And when the thing seems to fall, fall together, it clicks. I know it. And I don't go any further. But until it does, I'm miserable. And I race hell all over the place trying to get these things to happen. I shake them up. Well, this is any person who designs does the same thing. Uh, you shake it up and say, well, what if I took this and put it over here? Then what happens? And you keep going. And all of a sudden, it couldn't be any other, any other way. The funniest thing of all is a school is just starting construction. I've been on for four years, and it isn't my fault that it's been four years, but nevertheless, uh, it's starting construction. It's a handicapped school, a very interesting project. Limited funds, the needs are tremendous. And... Uh, the basic area in the larger building has an administrative area, and the, the Board of Education departments had certain feeling for arrangement, and they'd call in, we went to the various schools and found these things. We started out with a certain positioning of some of these elements, and we went through about five different positions, and we ended up trying to which seemed to me was probably the best way without knowing. And yet you had to go through that experience. had to go through it. But it was rather exciting, and I've enjoyed it very much, although I've reached a point where I almost was in despair. I began to think it was an exercise not going to be a building. Uh-oh. Are you busy then? You have well, I have that project under construction. It's in East Los Angeles. And we've lost, due to the delays that were caused, I didn't cause, due to changes of programs at work, we've lost two of the buildings, a hydrotherapy building and a development center for handicap that were very important in the project. We have the uh, trainable mentally retarded building, but it also will have certain rooms that are going to take care of some of the uh, hand physical handicap. And it'll be it's terribly needed. Is it a state facility? No, it's LA City. LA, oh. no, LA Board of Education, not so. Oh, it's, it's in East Los Angeles. That's more. It's in the uh, county, but mm -hmm. uh, LA Unified School District isn't just Los Angeles. You see, it's the county and whatever. San Fernando is in that area. I did a school there some years ago. But that's a challenging project, and I, I really enjoyed it very much. And I have such an admiration for the teachers in the handicapped schools. Yes. We would go through some of these things, and their patience, I would lose my mind if I had to do what they do. Do you know Rose Engel? I've been working with her. <coughs> she works with the Selden School. No. And just what you're talking about, uh, TMR. Yeah. And, and yeah, well, the big bride school down here is one I went to. And then several in the valley, and one in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, south central Los Angeles area. This integration thing is something. When you try to integrate as to color and to how oh, it's a matter of you, I think it begins to become absurd. The, the school is located in an area there, for instance, that's black. And the practically everyone in the school there is black. And they all have to be bused, these kids, because they're handicapped in some way, and so they must be and they don't limit it to that area. They come from other places, but basically they're in a black area. Now, why under the sun would anyone, this ugly guy, uh, thinks there ought to be 50% whites there? In that kind of a situation? Yeah. Well, now the one I'm doing is in the Latin area over in East Los Angeles. And they're, they aren't all Latin, but a, a larger percentage is. And as far as I'm concerned, they should be as dear there sort of home as possible and their parents should be involved in the PTA and things and they aren't if they take them over to the valley and take them down to here well this is a madness that I haven't accepted and it's all right who set up the 50 percent white in the first place it's all politics and the kids are kids are paying for it and they're not I know I don't think they're being prepared or helped at all they're not there's no special they're not introduction saying we they're have not. to work together now it's just like well I'm uh, uh, in there. I signed and got four other signatures on a petition uh -huh. for a state measure 
that's going to do a little more control on the judges. I think they, they think they're God Almighty, as far as I'm concerned. I think they have really, for some reason, their egos have taken over to a point where it's absurd. And there must be certain control on them, and this will help. So, boy, I would write it twice if I could. I should ask for another petition. <laughs> Let me ask you one question that I should have asked earlier about... You'll have lots of cutting on this tape, Oh, sure. But um, one thing that always interests me is the influences that help to shape your approach in your architecture, in your practice, early or developmental or laid just people or experience? Well, I've always liked a sense of order, even when I was a child. I had an arrangement for everything. And some of these are, are genes. Some of these are things that you inherit. Now, my son uh, is uh, very orderly, and my brother's son, my Alma, half-brother, is not. And they're the same blood. But different genes come from different areas, you know. My mother had a sense of, of design to a point, not to good taste, but a sense of design, and she painted China at that period, you know, skillfully. Imagine having plates with animals on it and serving dinner with brown gravy and you're getting an eye, catching the eye of somebody in there. <laughs> God, it's so absurd. Anyway, she meant well. But she had a pretty good sense of color, really, and my father didn't. He could see primary colors, and that was about the limit. He was perfectly happy with any uh, brilliant flower, but any subtleties. Oh, one funny thing I found out, uh, it almost has to be a distant family relation. On my mother's side, there was a, a, a Thornton Montagna, was his last name, and that's my middle name, mm -hmm. French Huguenot that went to Holland and then came over to New Amsterdam which is now New York. And uh, he married a Dutch gal, Annika Jans, I think, uh, Bogardus. And Bogardus is an ar architect in the early 1900s, that, or 18, I don't know, did the first steel building. The steel and so the name Bogardus mm -hmm. is somewhere, Bogardus. Uh, somewhere in the background of my mother's family, no matter what, the name mm -hmm. is there. Mm -hmm. And I've always rather treasured that. I thought that was rather okay. exciting. Breakthrough, anything that is kind of a construction and, and architectural breakthrough with those factories. Who do you think is really doing good work now with architecture? And what architects do you admire? That are, that are well, that's rather awkward, actually. I think Pei has done some very elegant things. I don't always like everything that anyone does, but I mean, he's done some very beautiful things. What do you enjoy? The, like the East Wing? Of the National Gallery? I like it with reservation. Well, I, I'm I, just wondering which projects you... Well, I'm thinking of uh, an art museum in upstate New York. I think you did the cantilevers out. It's a very elegant composition as a mass and the work as a building. And the whole thing is so clean and nicely done. It, it really is, a, a, I think it's an outstanding job. And, uh, oh heavens. What's his name in Skidmore as well? For, uh, has done a great deal of the design. They've done some beautiful buildings. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are some very good buildings that are built today by contemporary designers. There are many that aren't, but there are quite a lot that are. I think the, the Pacific Design Center is an exciting one. I think mean, it works beautifully, and it's it's an exciting thing. It does the job very well. I don't. I think the color is rather handsome, really. I don't mind it in a building that size. I would. I don't think I'd ever make a building all that color. I think I would normally would use a, a more neutralized color for a basic thing at large. It's like when a client brings in some paint stuff and says, "I like this for my living room wall or something." And my God, she brings in a in a color so intense. If you put it on a wall. He would stifle. Or somebody likes violet or, mm -hmm. or a plum color or something. They want a bedroom like that. You'd have a spot of it with a white background or a, or a, a off a neutral. 
but you can't use a pure color for an entire area without defeating the space in a way. I shouldn't say that arbitrarily because actually there are places where it really does work, particularly in an exhibit area or a place where you're not going to spend much time. I'm probably going to think more in relation to spaces that you spend time in. And those I think you would probably lose your mind if it was too dominant. I like interiors that you can enjoy doing what you want to do without uh, being too conscious except being pleased with the space you're in. And speaking of scale, I haven't done anything on that, but I think scale is every, it's relative. It's relative to the uh, 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 domestic scale. Is people are basically an average size, and the room shouldn't overpower them. Sometimes you can double the height of a space and get rather exciting things, but if it isn't done very well, you feel unco uncomfortable. In it. Like eating in the bottom of an elevator pit. I mean, you look up and you think, what for? <laughs> I think light sources are terribly important in scale and in relation to spaces. In fact, you change scale with them on occasion. Just by focusing the stronger lights and colors and things in certain areas and, and depreciating the rest, I mean, you have a different sensation of space entirely. Okay. You've been most generous. Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's fun having you here. <laughs> it's been I, delightful. Well, it's been terribly chaotic and confused, but perhaps you can piece yeah, it together for your record. I, I think some very good things came out. Well, I don't know. We'll continue to be in touch. Please. It was nice having you, and I, I wish you to know I mowed that damn lawn last night. <coughs> oh, I dear. was going to have to, my, my it's niece. It's a good thing we came out here and my, used I'm it. glad you did, because my niece. and the time they practiced mm -hmm. and uh, what they did and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is a summary that was invaluable in working on this. Yeah. And then, um, uh, that's Peter. This yeah. is just my big file. Uh, yeah. Gee, I really should spend, we should talk about this another time, but I really want to talk about you this morning. Well, okay, okay. I just wanted you to know that I dug. Since we have a limited time. That I dug this out. Uh, I'd love you to do that at school, maybe this summer. Um, did a, a lecture, they did a series of lectures. They have a wonderful uh, librarian at the, so at the South Pasadena Library, and they did a lecture series on. on well, it turned out to be Pasadena. They, Pasadena. They, they still have a wonderful librarian, but well, it, I that wasn't there. I, can't re I, I was in touch with her at one time, and I was very impressed with South her. South Pasadena? I can't remember if it's South Pasadena or Pasadena. But, uh, uh, both it was wherever the lecture series was. Yeah, this this series. And it, was the it was the architecture of the 30s and people who practiced in those years, you know, similar to what I'm trying to document. And so I was thinking it'd be fun to have him come maybe during the summer semester and do that lecture for us. You going to be around the summer? Tim, you going to be around the summer? Do you think that would be an interesting thing to have? Can, you know, another focus on that on that time, talking from a personal experience point. The, these were the ones that were covered. Thank you. Um, these are the ones that were covered in that talk because <clears throat> Neff, Lautner, Lautner, Harris, Harris Ain, Gale, Schindler, Schindler. Richard, Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright, and William Hertrick, who really doesn't count except <clears throat> he was the uh, landscape man for the Huntington Library. Uh huh. How about having Wit sit here? Is this better light? Yeah, they're both great. Are they? The lighting's a lot better than last time. Really? Oh, yeah. We went to visit Carl uh, the first time. We, we This is a new camera, and so we're experimenting with it. And, you know, I used to ask people to come into school to have a studio setting where we could talk. And especially I tried to do it during the series when people would be coming over anyway. I tried to get Quincy to do that, and he kept breaking appointments, and I never I never got it. But we have some other good uh, uh, 
things that he participated in, and I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we went to Carl, and we had very bad lighting. We were, you know, and the whole thing, it was just, so this time we're a little more experienced. We're trying to learn okay. from that. Well, as you know, okay. no, I have to leave 1130, okay. um, which I can't help. All right. We'd, we'd, we'd really um, like to know a little bit about uh, the beginning of your career, where, where you came from, where you went to school, that kind of, the years, uh, those years and what was happening and, you know, however you care to share that with us. All right. I, I assume it gets cut and patched. Sure. <laughs> anyway, sure. Uh, I'm a native son. I was born in Pasadena. Oh, great. And uh, went to USC. The reason I'm an architect is my uncle gave me a T-square for Christmas, and, I, and my mother thought I ought to do a church. But uh, <laughs> outside of that, I wouldn't want to be anything else except an architect. Uh, I really enjoy the work and the people, and... Uh, I can't imagine doing anything else, really. But anyway, I, <clears throat> I went to USC oh. and uh, afterwards went back and taught some over there with some fantastic people where I finally met people like Wayne Williams, my partner for some 25 years, and a fellow named George Haslin, and Carlton Winslow, and people like that were my students. So I had a lot of fun with her. What what years were you a student? In I was USC? a student from uh, 29 to 34, and then I taught there in 41. Mm -hmm. So you were in school under the Beaux Arts. Yes, system. the Beaux. Well, we had the interesting experience of being the revolutionaries. We thought of breaking away from the Beaux Arts, so we did two years of Beaux Arts, and I still have the old erectium doorway and done with the wash and everything, and it. Uh, which I guess now are becoming valuable. Yes. It, would, it would really be impressive today. <laughs> so uh, that was, we stopped sending our things then to New York. We had to send all our projects to New York to have them judged. Really? I had to Oh, sure. You, you, you sent your project there and the jury was there. But the teachers that were helping you, and I won't make any names, would say things like, that's terrible. You know, they'll never. And then you'd send it back and get a first merit or whatever you got, you know, and everything. And the teachers weren't teaching you what the jury judged, but your mm -hmm. grades were dependent on the Beaux Arts, and it was it was very who, mysterious. Who comprised the jury in New York? Oh, I don't really know now, but they'd be. Well, they would you know, choose they, New York architects. Well, they had they, the Atelier uh, system all over the United States, you know, and so it was a hierarchy of people who who believed in the Beaux-Arts. It was a national thing. So we all had to take two years of French because everybody had to go to Paris. Mm -hmm. And everybody was supposed to do that. Well, after 29 and 30, nobody, no students were going to Europe or ever even thought. In fact, I never even thought I'd be an architect. It was such a depression. It was a mental depression, not just a mm -hmm. financial depression. And everybody was really fairly sad about anything. Nothing was being built, uh, couldn't get any work, and so forth. It was, it was really sad. All of us went to work in the studios. <clears throat> and uh, I worked in the studios for a while, and everybody did and it graduated. So films were being built, even though... Well, that's right. The films were being films made. Were, houses weren't being built, but films were being made. Right. So, and that, it was an interesting experience, uh, because all the best old-time draftsmen were there. Nobody anymore knew really how to draw full-size plaster moldings and the, the classical styles when they were doing an old street or an old building. But the old boys were there, and we got to know them. And that was experience that you really didn't get unless you worked in a big office. So we did that for a while, and then uh, <clears throat> the Farm Security Administration, later called Resettlement Administration, was an interesting project. Uh, that a lot of us worked on. We went to San Francisco first. <clears throat> there was Garrett Eckball and uh, Burden Cairns and Vernon D. Mars. And <clears throat> we had a very interesting office. It's one of the few government offices which had a high standard and high quality of building. And the, I think people still talk about that because it was unique at the time. That, and that was due to Joe Weston. I don't know whether you've heard of 
<clears throat> of uh, Joe and Gene Weston, but they were twin brothers that practiced architecture here and did uh, banks and very interesting things, and then did experimental work with the Farm Security Administration. We were working on uh, uh, relocating the workers, the farm workers. Mm -hmm. They're still doing it, of course, but but that was going on, and we did some interesting adobe houses and <clears throat> subsistence homestead projects, and uh, then we all got transferred to Washington, D.C., and then we all got fired, and we all came home. And, and what year was that? Well, see, that was about 30, that was the end of 34, no, 36, excuse me, the end of 36. And uh, <clears throat> then, you know, we just scrounged around. I did renderings and, and you know, work for other architects and try to get going. And then... <clears throat> who were the firms who were doing work? Well, everybody was just kind of getting started, you know, again, between the period of the Depression and uh, the war that, you know, there was, there was a lot of, there were a lot of things going on. I, mean, uh, uh, I can't remember the exact year that Bill Pereira came out, but, uh, <clears throat> from Chicago. But uh, we had a three-man office. We had uh, Bill Pereira and Frank Bruce and myself. Oh. And we worked in the back garage of his house in uh, San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Frank went on, Frank Bruce went on and stayed with, with Bill uh, for a long time and did a lot of, of his work. I mean, theaters, hospitals, primarily hospitals, and then Frank went on his own. And, mm -hmm. um, so then my experience was with various people, including Harwell Harris and uh, Kim Weber. And uh, Kim was an uh, industrial designer, at least that's what he called himself. Mm -hmm. So when he got into architectural work, it was a little, so I, I worked for him for a short time. Did one house for him in the 30s? His I think of his work being strongly Kim, Kim in the 30s. <clears throat> the rounded forms. Uh, it was probably the end of that when I was there. He was a teacher at USC, <clears throat> and then he left and went to Art Center. Art Center, yes, I remember that. When he left, went to Art Center. Several of us did at the same time. Mm -hmm. We left too, and almost didn't graduate from SC because we. We were following a person that we liked, and Kim was my favorite teacher, Kim Weber. So, um, very interesting guy, and not enough's been done about him. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one, one little book. One book. I which, have it. Yeah. That's so, how I'm really familiar with his work. I think there's a rendering of mine in there. It, it, it it's a nice little pamphlet, but he did lots of things. I mean, it was extensive, and so. Well, then I worked for different, other different firms around town. Lawrence Test and uh, Marsh Smith and Powell, and then <clears throat> uh, came the war times. Well, when you worked with Harwell uh, Harris, what were you working on? Do you remember what things were happening? Well, I only worked there one semester. <laughs> what do you want to call it? It was a short period, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> it was all. Well, of course, it was all residential. Mm -hmm. And I can I could probably find out the names of the projects, but but he was uh, uh, he had a hard time delegating, like a lot of us do. I mean, you, you delegate to somebody and then you tell them it's not satisfactory and tear it up. So, uh, but there were Hugh Goodhue was there. There were several others that were there. That it was a going office really. He had a lot of work and. Uh, well, you know his story. Mm -hmm. he, he started out, taught himself by reading Frank Lloyd Wright and, and going to Trade Tech. <clears throat> I don't know if he mentioned Trade Tech. Well, it was called something else. It was some uh, similar thing where you'd learn drafting, you know. It was the same. Mm -hmm. But there were classes that Neutra taught in Hollywood at an art school. I think that was the connection with he and Neutra and Ain. Well, might be. Mm -hmm. um, now I have to look at I, I that. I worked for him after he was educated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, I see him once in a while. I haven't seen him often. I guess the last time was the tour that the SAH had of his. Mm -hmm. Well, then he projects. was here for the uh, the lecture series that we had at SciArc. 
I think that was the oh. last time he was here. I don't know what I saw him that time, but... Um, he spoke with you because uh, I think he called from my house. Oh. And you were talking about how <laughs> close the generations were being... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> sliced right. For yeah. Now. right. Yeah. Well, there were overlaps, you know. It was, <coughs> but uh, so you went to school with Wayne Williams, and then later on you. Uh, no, I no, I taught. Uh, he's ten years ah, younger. Ah, he was a student. You were teaching at that time, and then you formed a partnership. So then, uh, during the war, we <clears throat> did everything. You know, working at Caltech, and that's where I. Uh, the only time I worked with John Lautner was on the project in uh, San Diego, war housing. Mm -hmm. They sent all the architects from here down to San Diego. And we, uh, so the only thing we ever worked on together were things that we didn't like. Mm -hmm. we, we hated the whole thing. And so, uh, but we roomed together and so forth. So that was interesting. And then after that was all over, then uh, <clears throat> I immediately, uh, after working at Caltech, then I immediately opened a one-man office. And, and pounded that through for a while. Then, then Wayne came along, and then we did mostly residential, and then medical, and then uh, religious, and then got into recreation and uh, bigger projects, and then formed a thing called Community Facilities Planners, which consisted of uh, Garrett Ekbo and Cy Eisner and ourselves. And we did 40. What, what year was that? Um, it was an early idea of the <clears throat> collaboration of uh, interdisciplinary right. we, we had a lot designers. Of, we had a lot of names, you know. We, no, we I'm curious, you know, uh, at the time because it's various well, people have tried to do that. Okay, that m must be about um, oh well. I, I can't remember really, but it, it, it's at least uh, the 40s. The, in the 40s. Well, late 40s. Late 40s. Uh, uh, Late for us, and uh, we were great. Both Wayne and I were great on trying to form collaborations. We we thought that the team approach was, you know, which everybody's written books about now, and it's kind of old. But that the one man architect thing is gone, and uh, you need teams. And so we did 40 jobs as a as a group as community facilities planner, mm -hmm. CFP, mm -hmm. and then uh, <clears throat> probably 200 jobs unilaterally. Uh, which we'd y just use ECBO or we'd just use Eisner or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And that was fairly successful and it's completely collapsed now, of course. There, it, but it continued for a period of about, imagine, uh, six, eight years, something like that. So the, you, you started out with residential and then built to larger Yes, instead of, uh, instead of starting to work with another architect, which I imagine most architects do. I mean, as a, as a young architect, they get their license and they work for somebody else mm -hmm. and then break off mm -hmm. and form a thing. I just started out. I didn't have any work, but I just started. And so people come in and talk to me, uh, students. I, <clears throat> I talk to students a lot, uh, you know, from uh, San Luis Obispo and on their field trips and all that. Yes. And, they say, well, they, how do you get your first jobs to, so you can open an office? I say, well, you don't have to have a job to open an office. You just open it, you know. And somehow they, that doesn't seem right, that you could do that, you know, that you were revved up enough that you just start. So. What were some of the uh, ideas and goals that you had in your work at that time? Any philosophical well, direction not, that, that you felt strongly about? I'm not really a writer, you know, so I had, or a philosopher or historian or anything. I'm just an architect. And I think probably Wayne and I felt that that you could find something interesting in any kind of a project. I mean, the people or the. Uh, when we've met lots of interesting people, that's one thing you do as an architect, and uh, most of them good. And we have lots of friends, old friends that we met as clients, and. Uh, so you just, my idea is that you solve uh, problems. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about that word, problem, of what it means. But if, if there weren't any problems, I don't think there'd be any architects. I mean, if, so the way I interpret the word problem, it, it means a project or something to, 
to solve or resolve or a puzzle or a, something, and so you work on that. And it, sometimes you, you try to get things that are more meaningful, whatever that means, you know, or socially important or something. And it is more fun to do that. Like we did a whole series for Jack in the Box and and uh, mobile really? mobile gas stations and things like that. But and up to a certain point, they can be really good, particularly if you're contributing something. And we contributed a primarily Wayne contributed a Jack in the Box theme of uh, <clears throat> which is looks more like a Venturi today, and that that's at least uh, 20 years ago. In which the whole building was a was a neon sign. I mean, you know, it was a big mm -hmm. square, square thing where with is signs that? and gra well, they're all gone. Oh, I mean, because it, they finally said that wasn't any good. You know, that you needed a, another shape or something. So, but at that time, historically, uh, that hasn't ever been published that way. I don't think. But I think, you know, when Venturi comes out about the Las Vegas and so forth, that that uh, you know, certain architects that did a wide variety of things. You know, people say, "What's your style?" You know, or something like that. Well, we and like you say, it was you remember the Woody Goody and so forth. But but we did a whole series for uh, of uh, <clears throat> concrete block buildings, and uh, you know, we've done masonry. The uh, the residence halls at Cal Poly are. Uh, three-story tilde, which I believe... Is that Cal Poly Pomona? Not the old brick jobs, but the, the tilde up. They were three-story tilde up, which was, I, I believe at the time, was pretty, was the tallest, I don't know. I think three-story tilde up is pretty big. What year was that, do you recall? No, I'll have to... Well, that, 60s? Let's see. Um, well. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably in the 60s somewhere. I'm not so good on those dates, mm -hmm. unless I have something to remember, mm -hmm. to buy mm -hmm. or something. Um, but then, uh, in this particular building that we're sitting in, this uh, span, the 64-foot span over the parking, at the time was the longest, longest precast span. Mm -hmm. and hard to believe, but but T. Y. Lynn designed it. Really. And. Uh, then they went on immediately to do 100-foot spans and so forth. But mm -hmm. these were precast on the job, and the floor is post-tensioned. Uh, and this is now 15 years old. I can tell you about that day, because the mortgage is, is paid <laughs> off. <laughs> but, uh, but the post-tensioned floor, it's quite springy. I don't know whether you feel anybody going by, but it's quite a live building. And, uh, that's because the steel is all loose in the floor and it's mm -hmm. post tension. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, um, and then we did the longest plywood vaults that have been made, 75 foot plywood vaults. And Where, what, uh, that that's in a church in uh, uh, Monrovia. And uh, so we had a lot of interesting people working for us, and we were we were interested in a lot of different materials, and uh, and you know nobody's ever written about. I think it's fairly interesting. Uh, it, we never did really have the, the style thing like, uh, you know, like Neutra stuck to one, just one thing. Now, Harwell didn't. Um, no. Most of his popular things were one style, like the Prairie School mm -hmm. thing, but mm -hmm. he did a lot, a lot of different things and tried well, a lot. Well, when he went to Texas, he changed completely That's right. from what he had done in, in Los Angeles. Right. So that, and Berkeley. you know, when people say, what style do you do? You say, well, you know, I'm just good. <laughs> uh, I recall that you did some early uh, modern tract housing in the valley. Is, is, uh, some, of the, some of the earliest. Uh, um, you know, why, yes, we did, we did a lot of tracks. At the same time uh, that uh, Quincy was doing so. And, uh, so you were solving the housing thing, working, yeah, addressing. Yeah, we did. You know, we did the tract houses for what, you know, fifty dollars a house or whatever it was, you know, and do the site plans and the floor plans and the color schemes and the landscape and all the stuff, you know, and it, and we just you just grind them out, uh, and we thought, we thought honestly thought at the time that we were really were improving the mass housing thing, and. Uh, AQ went on with Eichler, and we went on with other people, Bucola and other people in Orange County, 
But at the time, most of the tract housing was being done by architects. It, it was a big surge in which... What it, was that, 50s? Yeah. And, and, uh, we were living in an Ed Fickett house at that time. Oh, yeah. That's how I, I, I was aware of also yours. I, I, th I think me, was, were the Fickett houses done earlier? No, about the same time. Same time. It was one. There, there were about half a dozen of us that were doing lots of tract. we do 500 at a time, you know, a tract of 500 houses mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. uh, the whole thing. <clears throat> so, uh, but then it, then it all reverted back to uh, Hansel and Gretel again, and, and you know. It, well, I, don't you think there was some impact though in the, in the builder, what became the builder's tract house with what you were doing in those years? Oh, you like to think so, but boy, I don't know. When you see some of them now, you wonder. Well, now there's a reversion, but I think you know, they would pick up the better details. Well, you hope so, but I'm discouraged about that, and you know that that ever really, really amounted to what we thought was going to happen. But, uh, but of course, mutual housing was something else. That, uh, that's what 47 or. Uh, because that, and, well, you know the story about that. I mean, that, uh, that the owners really picked uh, uh, A.Q. Jones and myself and Edgardo Contini, just kind of, they picked us out of a magazine, like you'd pick it out of a Sears or something. They picked three architects and they and told us that we were going to be partners. And normally that doesn't work very well. And, well but, that's interesting. But, but in that case, it didn't work very well, and of course, we became very close friends and did some other work together, but then all went different ways mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. How about the people who came uh, to work for you in your office? Any memorable uh, names that well, you can recall? Well, there are lots of, lots of people, but I wouldn't want to mention uh, names until I made my own list because I'd be sure to forget a lot of people. Oh, but, right. but there were I was just curious. There were a lot of uh, people that many. I mean, uh, I could probably think of uh, at least <clears throat> 20, if I take the time, uh, that came and became licensed architects and and uh, well-known on their own. And uh, some stayed a short time, some stayed a long time, and some uh, learned most of what they know about design, I think, in our office, and then went on to other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not bragging about that. That's just, I think, what really happened. Mm -hmm. They well, used it at a school. And that's the ideal tradition that goes on in an office, like handing the baton. I don't know where that goes on anymore. Uh, but well, hopefully it does. In, in Hopefully in most offices, I and mean, that's that's the advantage young people have of going to work in an office, becoming aware of what's going on and being delegated responsibility, developmental experience, and so forth. So I think that's that's what makes it all worthwhile. That's how, how they grow. What, uh, what else do you think would be... Uh, what else would you like to talk about in looking back and reminiscing about? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know about the reminiscing, except I, you know, I thought it was all good. But um, the, um, I, I say usually when I talk about the partnership Smith and Williams, we uh, we split up now uh, nearly seven years ago, and uh, <clears throat> it was a very peaceful operation because we just decided it would be better if we had separate practices. Uh, as opposed to many uh, partnerships that break up, architectural partnerships that break up, in which they become bitter enemies and there are big fights and all kinds of arguments. And so uh, Wayne and I are still uh, partners in real estate and we play tennis and, uh, yeah, and nice. it, was a, it was a very easy kind of a, a change uh, rather than traumatic. It, generally the, the partnership grew into uh, from like first 10 years in which the, the, practically the two of us did everything. I mean, we did the design, the working drawings, the supervision, the selling, the everything. And then it slowly got bigger and bigger, and so then we more or less had our own clients. So we weren't duplicating. Like, uh, I would work on medical buildings and churches, and Wayne would work on recreation facilities and mm -hmm. restaurants or something. And 
So <clears throat> that got kind of divided. So in, in effect, we were had our own practice, really, with a common drafting room at, sort of at the end because there wasn't enough time or to collaborate, and that was unfortunate, and of course it became less interesting. But we both like to uh, collaborate with people. We think you can get lots more information and, you know, not just electrical, mechanical, and structural and everything, but as many other people as you can get involved, other architects or... Uh, so there, there are many other offices that we've worked with jointly on projects and of our own accord or somebody suggesting we might work together. And so, uh, but, but then when I left, <clears throat> I decided to do it the other way and have consultants entirely. So I work on a different basis now. All my work is contracted out except my own personal mm -hmm. uh, administration and design. So everything else is is contracted uh, out to many of the people that I've known for over 30 years or so, consultants that I'd like to work with, and uh, everything from traffic engineers and acoustic and, and color and interiors and uh, the whole thing. On, uh, on this Huntington Library job, the, uh, uh, that's a 209-acre site. I've been working for them for six years, and we now have the project underway. Wonderful. It's a four and a half million dollar uh, um, entrance complex. And uh, when I tell other architects about subcontracting all the work, they uh, they know it won't work. It might work all right for a little house or something like that, but a big project it wouldn't work well. There's a four and a half million dollar project that's underway, and <clears throat> it was all contracted out. And I, but I'm the architect for it, and I think I have just as good control and uh, better selection and more efficient production. And I don't have to worry about a staff or, or whether their wife's sick or. Mm -hmm. So they, you do the initial design and then you hand it off for. Yes, or sometimes I uh, collaborate with a designer. If I think I could use some help or, or you know, need another idea or something, and but it, um, but there's nobody here today except my receptionist, secretary, and myself. And so people tend to think that well, I guess you've retired or something. You know, well, this morning there are probably uh, what 10, 12 people working for me this morning somewhere in other offices, and they're. They're participating on a contract basis, and they will bring in the material, and then we will prove it, change it, and submit it. And mm -hmm. So that's a rather innovative approach. Well, I think it is, and I, th I think that it uh, it has lots of flexibility because the most architects, like other executives, think you haven't made it, or the status isn't correct, unless you, or it's measured by the number of employees that you have, and you must have eight or ten people over here that you can direct and tell what to do and all that. In fact, the government applications, as you know, both city, federal, county, they all say have how many employees do you have and how many licensed architects, you know, and you have to think, what am I going to say? You know, I either say none or I say 50. I don't mm -hmm. know which to say, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to, it's hard to explain to a government agency. To a private client, it's easy to explain, mm -hmm. and you can tell them the people that worked on this and, uh, and how many consultants worked on the Huntington, for instance. We, we've had a number of, including library consultants, and John Follis was consulting on the bookstore design mm -hmm. and all that. So if you need somebody, you, you don't think that, unfortunately, many architects think they can do everything. Uh, and so they try to do everything and, and get into trouble. And that includes even things like parking lots, which People, architects think, well, you know, there's nothing to a parking lot. You just go to the graphic standards and draw it up. Well, <clears throat> on the uh, project at Santa Ana where we did the government center, that was 10 years ago now, and there, we had to park 8,000 cars. Well, I, I had three parking consultants. I mean, uh, we had the, uh, the parking consultant per se, and then we had the traffic consultant because you, you get them out of the lot, you have to get them on the streets. So we had the traffic consultant, and then we had a parking structure consultant. 
So in effect, we had three people, and they were all necessary, and they, and they all contributed a, a wealth of information. Mm -hmm. What was that project? Yes. That's Santa Ana County Civic Center. Civic Center. And we did the master plan. We didn't do any buildings. Uh, by um, by we, I mean community facilities planners mm -hmm. and that thing. But I was the project uh, <clears throat> architect for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's now being redone. Uh, not by me. It's, it'll be redone by somebody else. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, they did. That was satisfying because... Uh, Proofread. You know, there were really a lot of flagrant uh, errors. Anyway, I want to ask you that question again uh, because we're always interested in... Uh, in the early, I'm always interested in the early influences, uh, people whose work you might have admired, or ideas in the air, or something you might have read. Well, like we said earlier, uh, you know, I was in school at the time that the Beaux Arts went out and came in, so you you knew about the Bauhaus, <clears throat> and uh, we knew about Neutra and Schindler and their work, and. Uh, if you wanted to retain a um, modern architect in Southern California, you had about, at the maximum, you had about 10 choices. I mean, I'm talking about young or old or anybody. If you wanted a modern architect, you had about 10 choices. Instead of today, what do you got, 4,000 choices. Or, I mean, it was radically different. Uh, it, it's not just similar because Nobody today would come in, I don't think, and ask if you were a modern architect. I mean, unless they asked Jenks. <laughs> but, but, but you wouldn't ask you if you did modern work or something, because, of course, everybody does, or, you know, now you come in. But the, at that time, uh, there, there are a whole list of anecdotes about uh, people like uh, uh, Schindler and Neutra doing free sketches, you know, to try to get the same job. I mean, just a little house or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd, you'd, do a, you'd do anything, I mean, to, to try to get just one little house that you could get built and show how great you were, you know, and all that. And so this one house um, that uh, Larry Shepard, um, which in this other talk that uh, talk about Larry Shepard's house, he interviewed both uh, Schindler and Neutra, and uh, Neutra came with the drawings for the house and the contract and everything at the same time. And, and, Already to sign and, them up. And, and uh, he had clauses in there like that uh, any part of the building could be changed by the architect without the owner's approval. And <laughs> and so so he, he retained Jock Peters, who nobody's heard of, uh, to do the house, which uh, I really like. And, and But he, he did very few things, Jock did. He, uh, except the interior of Bullock's Wilshire. Mm -hmm. that's, but, that's what we mostly know him for, the Bullock's Wilshire. Right. Yeah. But he had done s stage sets, movie sets, and things, and then a few houses, mm -hmm. and unfortunately uh, uh, didn't live long enough to extend that. But he would have he would have gone into that same period with J.R. Davidson and all those, who uh, generally knew each other. And uh, so th that's kind of interesting. But anyway, there were, there were very few, if you were in the modern trend, which all of us in school were, there were very few people to be influenced by. I mean, you, there were very few magazines to show that work or anything, and so all of us had all of the magazines that had uh, Neutra and Schindler and, and Wright and all those people, and we all, I think, <clears throat> I think everyone in school at that time uh, felt Frank Lloyd Wright was the, probably the only great architect that ever happened, and uh, a lot of us still do. So uh, it, I don't think that, at least in my opinion, I don't think that's changed very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, He's due for a renaissance one of these years. Well, it seems like it, and, uh, but, you know, what, well, I, I won't talk about what they're doing now because the thing's changed since Mr. Wright's gone, the whole thing has changed. Oh, yes, but, I know. It was frozen in time. So from the, the last period, the very few people that came out of there, like like Bruce Goff and uh, 
John Lautner. The very few that came out that understood the principles were uh, are practicing and doing a great job. But uh, um, so that's really about the way it was, and, and uh, we uh, we weren't we weren't really influenced on our work because there wasn't any work. <laughs> you were you were studying academically, and mm -hmm. you. You kind of felt like, or I, I have to speak for myself, I kind of felt it wasn't really going to affect me because uh, I was never going to practice. I would, I would be in the studios or, or somewhere, you know. It wasn't going to be possible. That's how maybe I shouldn't have felt that way. Maybe there are others that didn't feel that way. But, uh, Even because of the economic times. Right. There, so there wasn't anything being built. Depressing. And uh, it wasn't like today that other people say they can't practice because the big architects get the big jobs, and the big jobs the only things that you can do any design on, and there aren't any small things and all that stuff. I don't think any of that's true. Um, and whether the, it doesn't seem to, there, there's so much more building right now with inflation and the, all the restrictions and, and, you know, everything from the Coastal Commission, the mm -hmm. energy, and, and all these problems that everybody thinks that it's impossible to practice, but you can still get things built, you know. And, we weren't building anything, and uh, there were there were very few. And like this thing about the 30s, you, I had a hard time, you know, finding finding those. And they're spread pretty thin. So you don't feel you were influenced by Mr. Neutra? No. Or Mr. Schindler? <laughs> no, but 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 they were they were just like um, the people are trying to say now that they you shouldn't be influenced influenced by the Bauhaus or something like that. All of us were influenced. There isn't a tract house that isn't influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, you were asking about other influences, but there isn't one single tract house that isn't somehow influenced by Wright. And, and uh, that's a hard thing for a lot of people to accept, but I honestly believe that, that adaptations of the prairie style mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all that and kind of thing. And the plan, the explosion of yeah, the Yeah, the open and plan all and all that. that stuff. And, the, um, and a lot of people were by the Greens, and it turned out that the Greens weren't affected by right at all. I mean, that that everybody kind of thinks somehow they were influenced by Japan or... They were, so the Greens you know. and, and right were sort of parallel oh, yes, regional were. phenomenons. That's how right. I look at it. And they at. never met, and they and they never really thought about that. They, they, they were, it's like people say, you, you your stuff looks Japanese or something. In fact, Time had an article in which we were, Smith and Williams were called Japanese. You know. mm -hmm. And, because uh, of your pavilion at Descanso Gardens? No, well, that was long after that. It was just some kind of a thing. I don't know. Uh, because if you use natural wood and off the ground and sloping eaves and wide eaves and related each room to the outside and all that, well, those were principles of using natural materials and all this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. it turns out if you, if you use the same principles, they've got to think of a name for it, so it turns out to be Japanese, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. so, but, do you feel you were influenced by the Greens' work here in Pasadena? Oh, sure. I mean, it's probably in the use of materials. Probably as much as any any uh, any strong influence. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's there's well, there are a lot of funny things about that. I my my parents knew the Gambles very well, and so I was there when I was like 12 years old and uh, <clears throat> saw the house, and then I didn't think much of it at the time, but when I graduated from uh, USC, then I went over and then really went through it, of course, and and then, but nobody was interested in the Greens, I mean. Not at that time. Oh, no. It was, it was kind of uh, funny old houses, you know, and so, but I thought that I'd invented the uh, integral wood pull and the indirect lighting and all this stuff, and here I saw that the Greens had already done all that, you know, long ago, and done it better. And so that, uh, I was very awed by that kind of a thing. So, um, but they, uh, and I knew, uh, I knew Henry long after they'd given up their practice, Henry Green. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting to talk with him because he couldn't, he was driven out, I don't know, they, they had a lot of reasons why they stopped, which is a whole other story. But uh, I remember him saying that, uh, he understood that today, practicing, that you had to put everything on the drawings, and then you had to have a firm bid. 
And he said, I don't see how anybody could practice like that. You have to go out on the job and change things and adjust uh, the things. The master builder and all approach. That stuff. Yeah. I said, no, you can't do that anymore. You have to have a firm price. And he said, well, that's terrible. You know. So there's another reason why he, he couldn't practice. They, they generally had wealthy, mm -hmm. not always, but they generally had wealthy clients. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, I thought that uh, they might have been affected by the Panama Pacific Exhibition. Yes. and what Bertram Goodhue did in right. San Diego and how right. that began the Spanish colonial revival and changed the taste again to the uh, There isn't any question about direction. that, but they did, they did a lot of things that, you know, like, like you were saying, you thought that you, you connect me with a certain kind of style. Everybody connects them with the bungalow and the wood thing. But they, there are a lot of plaster things around, yes. and there's an old English an old English house that we were well, right around that arroyo. And we remodeled and, yes. and all that stuff. And uh, they did, they did a wide variety of things. But it turned out that the historians, you pardon the expression, think they have to pick some style that he did. And but didn't do they? For the most part, they did a wood uh, bungalow. For the type most house. part, but they were. When you look through the actual list including the elementary school that I went to school in. The, really? The Washington is that, school. Is that still it? Oh, yes, Longfellow it, School. In its uh, original yeah. Longfellow School? It's terrible. Where, where is that? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> no, you know, and they did they did store buildings, and they, they did, you know, they did a practice just like the rest of us. And uh, they had to, the job to come in, they had to do it. They had oh, that's to an eat or it something. is an interesting point, and we tend to box. Sure, they th you think of the Gamble House, the Blacker House, and two or three other things, and you think, wow, you know. Well, that was done in a short period, four or five year period that they did, 19, what, 1905 to 1915 or so, whenever it was. Mm -hmm. And they must have been going like mad, you know. They had a big office and did their own furniture. And <clears throat> but that uh, one thing, uh, the Greens did say, you know, that they could not have practiced like they did or had the product except in this certain limited economic climate. Everything was just right. They got here just the right time and the people, the clients got here just the right time and the climate and all that kind of stuff and the material and and it, they never, I mean, 10 years earlier or 10 years later or, you know, they that would never have happened. That was the part that was the accident. It, if they'd arrived in Houston, Texas, instead of Pasadena, or if they'd, or if they hadn't gotten here just the right time, and the wealthy people hadn't come, and uh, and wanted something different, and all that, they, it was just just right. And they, and uh, plus their talent, but it, but the whole thing overlapped mm -hmm. to be perfect. The question and, uh, of timing. And the, at one time, I had. Uh, Henry's permission and Charles both to write their book, and uh, uh, this is when nobody was interested in the Greens or anything like that. But I, I was, and I said, you know, somebody's got to write this book, you know. And so I, I had the permission, which uh, uh, <clears throat> Randy Mackinson thinks is pretty funny, <laughs> because I, I was the first one to get permission to write the book, <laughs> and uh, uh, then I. I muffed it because uh, I had so much else to do. Sure. I, I, uh, in fact, I, I moved to San Diego because of the war problem and all that kind of stuff. And so I just finally ignored it. I had the drawings and I took some photographs and everything, and then I just forgot it. And by the time I got back to it, well, I then other people were scrambling for it now because they they thought it was important, and so. Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't it? It was Harwell's wife who was really. Jean, Jean Marie Bangs. Mm -hmm, who really but, started uh, researching right. and writing. Well, that's sort of when I was there, too, and so we, we knew about that and talked about that. And, uh, but then she never carried it to no, fruition she never, either. She never made it either. I think either. that's a, uh, an interesting Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure why she didn't, because. She was really considered the person who was the most likely, from what I understand, in that's reading correct. about it. That's correct. And she was a writer. and. Uh, you know, and interested in that kind of mm -hmm. thing. She did a lot of writing and writing about cooking. And she's still you know, doing that. She's doing that yeah. in Texas now. But where I wasn't a writer, I mean, I, you know, I was just kind of doing it as a hobby. I thought somebody ought to put all this together, and so uh, I had the only restrictions the Greens gave me was something like it couldn't, the book couldn't have any advertising in it or, or something like that, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But, or they had to approve the pictures or something. But, but anyway, that. 
uh, that never happened. But it's interesting that the Spanish uh, had a bad reputation, the Spanish uh, oh, yes. architecture, and uh, and then the Greens. The, I still remember a realtor coming in, and we were telling him about the green and greens, and he said, yeah, if you if you cut off the eaves and paint them white, he says, they aren't half bad. So Amazing. that was what people really thought at the time. They were dark, dingy, you know, not pleasant, anything. And they had the whole bit, the whole California relationship, the indoor-outdoor, the whole thing. And uh, yeah, that that was uh, an inspiration, whether they were an influence, but it was it sure were an inspiration to all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about the case study house program? Are you involved with that? Well, I did two that weren't built. And uh, <clears throat> I have a lot of, lots of funny stories and, and, and things that happened in that and why certain ones succeeded and didn't and how commercial the whole project was rather than uh, mm -hmm. uh, really. More commercial than promoting design? Yes. Do you feel? I, I thought maybe it was sort of a partnership well, to make it go. Well, the magazine was, of course, the only one on, on modern architecture, or whatever you want to call it, that everybody subscribed to all over the United States. And, of course, they they wouldn't have anybody that, that wasn't really published in it that would be a case to the house program. But the difficulty of getting them built, I mean, there was no financial program. The, the, you had to find an owner. Mm -hmm. The architect himself had to find the owner to build the house. And so if you go through them, you'll, you'll notice that, you know, everyone from Eames on all the way through, they, they, were, they had the money and the owner to build the house. The magazine didn't have any money. And they would try to get the concrete block donated or the something donated. And in fact, my Adobe, <coughs> one of them was an Adobe project, one of the two case study houses. And of course, that immediately changed to concrete block when they found out that they could sell a full page for the concrete bar company and all right, kind of stuff. And right. so there's so many funny yeah. things about the story, about the whole story, which uh, nobody, I don't even want to talk about either because it's kind of a myth and, and a kind of an interesting history that nobody, you don't want to knock it. It was, no. it was great, it you was know. the closest thing but, we had to what was done in Germany in the display of uh, right. the Weisenhof and the other Right. colonies that they did displaying the virtues of modern housing. Well, we tried to do one in Watts later. I tried to do a sample housing project in Watts later, which didn't get built either. But, but the, it's a good idea to do that, and it did do a lot of good. <clears throat> but the uh, connections with the uh, advertising programs and the complexities of getting it done and the and, and how you had to do those houses on speculation, I mean, anyway, uh, just to get them published. In fact, uh, we had so much time that we'd be doing uh, projects for arts and architecture just doing them. You know, they, they, you know John and Tenza would call up and he'd say, what have you got, you know? And so you'd sit down over the weekend and design <laughs> something. Really? No, you would. And you'd send it in, and it would be published. You could get anything published that, if you were on particularly if you're one of the advisory board or somebody that mm -hmm. knew him or something, you just mm -hmm. send it in and, and with all the typo errors and everything, it would be printed. <laughs> okay. You know, I warned you I had to go. Right. I'm, I've run out anyway. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, enjoy Thank the whole you. thing. Thank you, Whit. We'll continue to talk, all right. of course. All right. uh, I don't have this... Uh, this thing type and, and gee I'd, I'd really love for you to think about coming and doing it in the summer semester okay. you know that's one and the Japanese the Japanese another. gardens would be another thought we'd do some just some fun easy programs for, for over the summer for those of you who are going to be in, the, in school not in school but around school. around so yeah well we'll publicize it of course but uh, I think we need a change of pace from all this hyper aesthetic Nonsense. Let's go. Have a conversation. You didn't give him a hard time. Oh, I did. If you were there, I think I would have joined up with you. I've never taken him on, you know, because when he first came here, he really is a disarming young oh, man, yeah. and I really liked him. We mm -hmm. had him come over and do a series mm -hmm. of classes at SciArc, mm -hmm. and uh, uh,
Are you still shooting? Yeah, but it's changed a lot. No, but I'm, I'm sure he does somehow. concepts and he right. goes back and forth. But there might be like a couple of key things like his quality control. <laughs> I think it's really possible when one carries that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I want to try to shoot the garage somehow. 